Hello and welcome. I call the channel The Jungle Nook and today we're going to be up potting a couple different varieties of peace lilies. And I'm going to show the potting mix that I like to make up for these guys and explain why I'm using the materials that I am. As well as give some tips on what we can do for the long term care to ensure that they stay nice and healthy and happy. As well as what we can do to get them to flower. Peace lilies are actually a really easy plant to get to flower, even when growing them indoors. But first, regarding the, uh, the potting mix, I would never recommend using topsoil in any kind of container, be it a hanging basket or a pot, because topsoil will retain too much moisture and can promote root rot. Also, as it breaks down, it can become very compacted, especially if you let it dry out. If you let the topsoil overly dry out and then you try to re-moisten it, that will also cause the soil to become very compacted and the plants will have a hard time growing the roots through that soil. So these are the two plants we're working with today. They're both peace lilies, not exactly sure of the variety, but they're both peace lilies and they like slightly acidic soil. So we're going to be using peat moss today because peat moss is slightly acidic as opposed to coco core, which is neutral. So I'm using miracle Grow potting mix because it's mostly peat moss. There is some other organics and slow release fertilizer in here, as well as a little bit of perlite. Now, peat moss is actually sphagnum moss. The sphagnum moss, the long fibered moss, this is what is uh, on the top. You can see some here, I got some soaking so it would be hydrated, but it's long fibered. Now when it's in this form, it is neutral, but it retains a lot of moisture and these plants we're working with, they like to stay nice and moist. So we'll be putting some of that in there. And the peat moss, this is uh, actually decomposing sphagnum moss. It's what's underneath the, uh, the long fibered stuff out in the wild and it is slightly acidic. So the pot that I'm using, it has a lot of little slits and holes in it for drainage, as well as a tray down here where that water will flow into. So when I have this in the house, um, the water won't go on the floor, but we're gonna be making up a real nice well draining potting mix that will be able to drain but the pot needs to be able to drain that water out and away from the soil. So first I'm gonna mix up a drainage layer in here. And I'm gonna fill this up about halfway with this product here, which is mostly peat moss. And then to that, I am going to put almost an equal part of some uh, some perlite. The perlite it's just a volcanic rock it's really nice it doesn't decompose or break down and it will provide a lot of drainage as well as uh, nice air pockets in the soil as well because roots do require oxygen to get down into the roots so they'll stay nice and healthy and to prevent root rot. Now, to that, I am also going to add some of that long fibered moss. And I pre soaked this for a few hours and I had put some rocks on it to hold it down. And I'm just going to put a little bit of this in here because this will uh, get nice and moist and retain moisture longer because. Petite lilies really do like moist soil. Not wet or saturated waterlogged soil, but this will retain moisture a little bit longer. And uh, the perlite is going to help with the drainage. And the peat moss, that is also going to retain moisture, but is uh, slightly acidic. And then I'm just going to give that a mix. It takes a lot to hydrate peat moss, 
So I'm just going to give it a little bit of water right now. Might seem like a lot, but it takes a lot. Now I'm going to mix up the, the next layer, the layer that goes on top. And again, I'm going to use the peat moss. Now to this right here, I'm not going to add any additional perlite because perlite floats and I don't like that look on the top of the pot. But you, you could mix all these ingredients together and just, just do it like that. This is per, personal preference for me. Now I'm going to put in some orchid potting mix. And all this stuff is right here is bark. And this will take a long time to break down and release additional nutrients, organic nutrients into the soil. And I'm going to mix this up a little bit. And put a little bit more of this uh, sphagnum moss in. Now, if I didn't mention it before, sphagnum moss, as far as the pH is concerned, is neutral. Whereas the peat moss, which is older and has begun to uh, decay and break down, decompose, that is slightly acidic, which is what we want for the peace lilies. Now, as you see, I'm just taking this and kind of just kind of keeping it fluffy. I'm not taking it and wringing it out or nothing because then it becomes hard. You want it, you want it to be kind of uh, fluffy in there and just mix it in. The ratios really aren't all that important. You know, it isn't a fine science. Um, think about these guys growing out in the wild. You know, the soil is not exactly the same everywhere where these are growing in their natural environment. Mixing that up, bringing over the peace lily. Now this peace lily has been in this pot since I bought it. I like to keep my pot, my plants in the original pot for at least six months, but I think this guy's about two years old in here. So when I first pick out my plants, I always make sure they're not root bound because I am going to be leaving them in the pot for at least six months or so. And I don't want them to start out root bound right from the beginning. And the reason I keep them in the pot for so long is because I like to bring them home, put them in the spot in the house where they're going to be staying, and let them get used to that spot as far as the humidity, my watering regimen, uh, the lighting in that spot, and just get, let them get accustomed to their new spot, their new home. Now this guy is a little bit root bound. Not going to do nothing real dramatic, but I'm going to loosen it up just a little bit, especially down here at the bottom where it had begun curling and spinning around at the bottom of the pot. This will help stimulate new growth and help the plant to uh, grow its root structure out into a more, a more natural pattern that the plant wants to do. Now, I'm going to put this in the pot and make sure that the top is right about where I want it to be after I fill in the soil around it. Now, the reason that I did this the way I did, where I actually put a drainage layer in and then I mixed this up with the organics. There really weren't many organics down, down below, just what came in the... Uh, the potting mix. I didn't add any of the uh, orchid bark to the bottom is because as I water this plant and as these organics are breaking down, it's going, those organics are going to filter through to the bottom of the pot. And that's really all I'm doing with this guy here. Don't get too hung up on the ratios. I've said it before, but don't get too hung up on the ratios. You know, this right here is probably about 50% peat moss. Um, maybe 30% uh, perlite and about 20% of the orchid bark. And I did put in some of the sphagnum moss as well. 
and it's been up potted. Now, as you'll notice, this is slightly larger of a pot than what you would normally hear. They'll say only up pot at one to two inches. This was more like three to four inches. Uh, I like to be able to keep them in their pots for a long time. Every time you up pot, you do run the risk of shocking the plant, damaging the roots. And there's, there's plenty of space in here for these roots to, uh, to grow out and keep their, their natural uh, root structure. Oh, yep, see the water's coming out the bottom. That's actually good, I'm happy to see that. As you see, I'm not real particular about the actual amount. I'm just adding a bunch of perlite in here at my drainage layer to ensure proper drainage and aeration. Add some of the sphagnum moss without wringing it out or squeezing it. I especially add the sphagnum moss to plants that I know will also be spending time out on the porch for the summer where I know it will be warmer and I'm more likely to to miss a watering or do an inadequate watering. You're going to want to water these guys at least once a week. If you're watering them less than once a week, what I would recommend is that you give them a little bit of water and then you come back later that day and water them again until you see some water coming out of the bottom of the pot to ensure you don't have dry pockets in there and that the soil is evenly moist. It's important for these plants not to dry out. In their natural environment, they, uh, they are not growing in soil that you know, dries out completely in between waterings when it rains. Uh, these are tropical. It rains every day in the tropical rainforest and they like to stay moist. And having uh, nice moist soil is ensuring that they have the nutrients they need because when they're sucking up that water, that water is what is absorbing the nutrients and it's how the plant gets its nutrients is through the water uptake. Sorry about the noise in the background. My neighbor's mowing. It's a beautiful day. I don't blame him to be out here doing some, some yard work. But this, this one here, what I did not show you, I don't think, was that it was in this pot also because it was in the house. And this pot here has no drainage at all. That's a no-no. <laughs> but yeah, I had it in there. And that's why the leaves... That's why the leaves have the edges turning brown. The tips or the edges turning brown, the leaf turning yellow, um, or the plant actually wilting are all signs of overwatering. Underwatering can also cause, you know, some yellow leaves, browning. Usually though, the whole leaf will start to turn brown if, it's, uh, if you're not watering it enough. And if, the, if it's wilted and you water it and it perks back up, yeah, definitely it was uh, in need of water. But if you know the if the soil's staying moist and the leaves are wilting, turning yellow, or turning brown on the edges, that's overwatering. This was in a uh, a pot with inadequate drainage. But the pot has drainage and the soil is well draining, so this plant should do really well. And as far as the lighting requirements for these guys they like a lot of bright indirect light if you have them in your house a east facing or north facing window is great for these guys they really appreciate and love the morning sun that first sun that they get in the morning um, if you got them outside though they can handle a little bit of sun but definitely not the noon sun you don't want them getting noon sun that will burn your burn your plants even outdoors, try to keep them in a shady spot that gets filtered light, but a lot of hours of bright indirect light. That's what these guys need in order to flower. They're real easy to get to flower. Flowering really, uh, that the biggest thing that's gonna influence that as long as you're keeping them hydrated and you got them in a good soil, that is uh, sunlight. That morning sunlight is what they will really need to, to be uh, pushing out some flowers for you. Now we added uh, fresh organics into these pots with the orchid bark, but every, uh, maybe every three months or four months or so, 
I will add a thin layer of earth castings every three, four months, and that is uh, replenishing the fresh organics. But also, I will use an all-purpose plant food. Most plants require the exact same nutrients and use them in the same way, and don't really, you know, get too hung up on the brands of stuff. You know, an all-purpose plant food will have all of the nutrients that the plants need. However, the primary nutrients, the ones that will be listed first, nitrogen phosphorus and potassium those first three numbers the plant requires three times as much nitrogen as opposed to the phosphorus in order for it to adequately engage in photosynthesis the potassium that last number out of the three at a minimum you want that to be somewhere in between those first two numbers so a three one two ratio is what you want so if the phosphorus is a 10 that means you want the nitrogen to be at a 30. And the potassium, that last number, you'd want that to be around a 20. At a minimum, it can be higher. The nitrogen is what uh, the plant is primarily using to create chlorophyll. And the chlorophyll creates the energy that the plant needs to engage in photosynthesis. And the phosphorus is what it's using to actually engage in photosynthesis if you have the same number for all three of these and your nitrogen is the same as the phosphorus you're going to have a nitrogen deficiency and the plant won't be able to engage in photosynthesis efficiently